Hallelujah. At this time, I'll be sharing with a title, The History of the Kings of Judah. And the main passage comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. I'll read it for you. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. This is the word of God. At this time, we're going to think about the history of the kings of Judah and how the word of God passed down just as he promised to King David in today's passage. There are three objectives that we are going to be considering throughout this study. First, we're going to think about the role of the kings. When God created mankind in the Garden of Eden, God put Adam in charge of all the creation. And Adam was like regent king who was given the authority, given the position to rule over in place of God. However, God's presence is not taken away. God is the king of all kings. And later in the history of Israel, God is restoring the sovereignty of God in his, in, among His people. And after giving them the law, which is the sovereign word of God, God gave them the sovereignty through this kingdom. And while other nations had kings, uh, human kings, Israel did not have a human king. And so they requested God of the human kings. However, the difference in, among the people of God, people of Israel, was that human kings, just like David had shown us, were supposed to represent the true king of heaven and and eternal king, God. However, in this history of the kings, we can see that they have lost that role and they have forgotten and did not fulfill that role. Secondly, we're going to think about the continuing of the covenant of God, the, the faith being passed down. In the History of Redemption series, Reverend Abraham Park, the author, continues to emphasize and bring out the, the importance from the Bible, the importance of passing down the faith to the next generation. And through this genealogy of the kings, we're going to see how that covenant faith is passed down. And then lastly, we're going to think about the Messiah, the eternal king, who is to come, just as we just read in Second Samuel chapter 7. He, he is to come as the descendant of David, as the eternal king. So how is he coming in this genealogy, in this lineage of Judah and David as the eternal king? So let us think about the 20 kings in the southern kingdom of Judah. And it will be it's 20 kings, so it's not short, but let us, uh, I'm going to cover them briefly. I'm going to talk about the main points of their deeds, their achievements, and then God's evaluation of whether they were good, wicked, or extremely wicked. So first king after Solomon was Rehoboam in the southern kingdom of Judah. And I will not mention every time, but the Bible passage that apply to that, uh, that cover this uh, character uh, in parentheses, Second Chronicles chapters, chapters 10 through 12, and then their regnal years, 930 to 913 B, B.C. In Second Chronicles chapter 11, verse 17, it tells us that Rehoboam was strong and did well for the first three years. However, it goes, continues on to chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, he forsook God's word when he became powerful. And you will see that this is the, the pattern. This is, uh, this is the weakness of humankind. When they are in need, when they're, they don't have enough power, they are speaking God and they're holding on to God, depending upon God. But once they become powerful, 
they forget about God, they forsake God. So he forsook God's word when he became powerful. 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 12, 22 through 28 tells us, He built high places, sacred pillars, and ashram on every high hill and beneath every luxuriant tree. Not only did he forget and forsake the word of God, but he started to follow other beliefs. And you and I know that because Solomon married uh, many wives and concubines from different countries and different cultures and religions, and allowed them to bring in their gods and idols, those Gentile gods became prevalent throughout the land of God, a land of Israel and Judah. There were also male cult prostitutes in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord uh, dispossessed before the sons of Israel. Hence, God sent Shishak, the Egyptian king, to take away the treasures from the temple and palace. And this is another pattern, uh, another part of the pattern. They become powerful, they forsake God, and they bring in I other idols, they worship and build shrines. And then God uses foreign nation and foreign powers to punish them. And then they return, uh, and sometimes they don't. But Second Chronicles eleven twenty one and chapter 12 tells us that Rehoboam had 78 wives and concubines, and his mother was an Ammonite. He was influenced by them to idolatry. So God's evaluation, he was a wicked king. Second king, after Rehoboam, was Abijah, also known as Abijam. Second Chronicles 13, 1 through 18. He, he ruled from 913 B to 910 BC. Covenant of salt allowed him to destroy the 800,000 troops of the north with only 400,000 from the south, from his kingdom. And so he gained great victory. Second Chronicles 13, 21 tells us he became more powerful, but he became proud and did not take care of the nation. Rather, he had 38 children through 14 wives and lived the rest of his life flesh in fleshly desires and pleasures. So again, uh, once things become more comfortable because they receive more power in the nation, they not only turn away from God, but they forget their role as a king. They do not take care of the people. And God's evaluation, also wicked. See, David and then Solomon. And Solomon let other gods into the nation. And after that, the descendants uh, two generations already are continuing to be wicked. And so something that we can think about in our life, something that we don't do well, if we let other beliefs, other religions, other gods into our life, our children may be affected by that also. Third generation, Asa or Asa, Second Chronicles 14.3 tells us, He destroyed the altars of the Gentile gods, high places, and the ashram. Finally, he carried out a complete religious reformation. The nation was in peace for 35 years. However, 36 years after he became the king, there was an attack from the north. In this national crisis, rather than coming to God first, he depended on the king of Aram, which was a stronger nation during that time. And he gave treasures of the temple as payment to the king of Aram. So rather than coming to God and giving him offering or giving, asking him to help him, he gave what belongs to God to this human king Aram to depend on him and to ask him for, for his help. 39th year of his reign, he had a disease on his foot. And he did not seek God's help, but he went to every different physician, but he did not find any cure. Second Chronicles 16.12 God's evaluation, he was good in the beginning, but later he became wicked. Fourth is Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a good king. He followed the example of his father David's earlier days and did not seek the Baals or other gods. He followed God's commandments. So the Lord established the kingdom in his control and all Judah brought tribute to him and he had great riches and honor. He removed the high places and Ashram from Judah. 
However, in Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse 1, it says that he gets his son married to the northern king Ahab's daughter, whose name was Athaliah. That was his one big mistake. Probably intended, according to human thinking and human policies, trying to reunite with the north by, through marriage, and then, uh, and then, bec but b because of that marriage, northern influences of idolatry, sinfulness, all those came in. Marriage became a, a hole or an open door for Satan's influence to just flow into the southern kingdom. Immediately he found peace, immediately right after he uh, uh, allied forces or, or uh, nations with the north, Ahab's family, Ahab and Jezebel, uh, through marriage, immediately he found peace and reconciliation with the north. But Baal worship spread throughout Israel and Judah, as I mentioned uh, uh, just now, and Judah had to suffer the consequences over 80 years, even after his death. Still, God's evaluation is good that Jehoshaphat, uh, unlike other kings, when he became powerful, he did not become proud or reject or, or uh, forsake God, but he continued to try to do God's work and, and be a good king. Although his mistake was in this getting his son married to the family of Ahab and Jezebel. And that son's name is Jehoram fifth generation, he was married to Athaliah, Ahab's daughter, and he did not follow the good ways of his father, but follow the ways of Athaliah and her family. It seems that it is easier, or there is more uh, tendency of uh, human beings following the evil ways more than the good ways. Therefore, Baal, Baal worship, Baal worship spread throughout in order to strengthen his royal authority, he killed his brothers with sword. He died a horrible death later of his intestines bursting out. God's evaluation, again, wicked. And then there come four uh, kings after him. Ahaziah, Athaliah, Athaliah was his wife, Joash, and Amaziah. These Kings were omitted from the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1. And uh, in the, from this second period, as we are talking about the second period of Jesus' genealogy, they were omitted. Reason? They were all related to Athaliah in a way and influenced by her. And when we are influenced by Satan's schemes, especially in his uh, attempt to wipe out the work of God or interrupt the work of God and, and in interrupt, interrupt the, the flow of God's seed, which was God's way of fulfilling His covenant and promise, then those are taken out of God's genealogy. Athaliah attempted to dry up the seed from the royal lineage of Judah. Satan was using her to cut off the line through which the, the eternal king, the Messiah, was promised to come. She was extremely wicked, and the other four kings ended up also wicked. The tenth king is Uzziah. Uzziah depended on the Lord, and the nation became powerful and fortified. Um, this is my own thinking, but after seeing all these generations perish because of Athaliah and the northern uh, influences, I think the next king might want to try to be good, right? Uh, so Uzziah depended on the Lord and the nation became powerful. The nation became prosperous also by the blessing of God. But he became arrogant again and proud. That's the weakness of us human beings. Uh, once he became powerful, he became arrogant and proud and, became, uh, and, uh, and crossed the line to the priestly duty. He thought not only could he be king, but he can do, also do priestly duties. God, because according to the law of God, king cannot fulfill the priestly duty. 
And so God gave him leprosy, and he had to suffer the rest of his life in separate house until death. His pride ruined his reign, and he could not accomplish anything good, nor could he pass down good faith to the next generation. God's evaluation, good to wicked. Eleventh, Jotham. Jotham did right in the sight of the Lord and became more powerful. Although the king tried to live by faith, his people were living in wickedness. Jotham, however, had limited leadership that he could not influence people to follow in the right ways. His evaluation, God's evaluation of him, is still good, although he was not able to influence the people to become good also. Then comes Ahaz. He did not do right in the sight of the Lord. From the beginning, he made molten images for Baals. He sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. He burned his sons in fire, according to the abominations of the nations, whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel. So he followed. He brought in the the culture from other idol worshiping nations, and followed them. And one of them was burning, sacrificing their own children. And when the north was attacking, he depended on the powers of Assyria rather than God. So in all in all, in every aspect, he was not good. Uh, rather than de- uh, repenting, he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus. So this Ahaz seems to be rejecting and, uh, and being just sinful and wicked, at the face of God, and again and again, even when he's given a chance to repent, he's not repenting but praying and sacrificing to the Gentile gods. He destroyed the utensils of the temple, shut the doors of the temple, and made idols throughout Jerusalem. Thus he was buried in the city in Jerusalem, not into the tombs of the kings of Israel. God's evaluation, he was extremely wicked. Hezekiah, he did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. Uh, This expression was applied only to Jehoshaphat and here Hezekiah. He opened the doors of the temple that were closed during during his father Ahaz's time and repaired them. He brought in the priests, and the Levites, and gathered them into the square on the, on the east, and he cleansed the temple and revived proper sacrifice in the temple. <clears throat> People repented, and they brought uh, all the offerings that they could not uh, until that point. He carried out a religious reformation, reinstituted the Passover. People sang praises with joy, bowed down, and worshipped God. And Hezekiah And the people rejoiced over what God had prepared for the people. People celebrated with joy. When Sennacherib of Assyria invaded Judah, uh, and surrounded Judah, remember, uh, Hezekiah prayed with the prophet Isaiah, and God defeated 185,000 overnight. We know that story. And Hezekiah became sick to death because of his mistake and pride, but he received 15 years of extension through repentance. Although he was known as the greatest king in Judah after David, he could not pass down the faith and the covenant and righteous deeds to his son Manasseh. So God's evaluation of Hezekiah was good, but his son Manasseh, Manasseh, rebuilt the high places that his father had broken down. So do you see these high places being rebuilt? broken down, rebuilt, broken down. Also the temple of God, uh, defiled and then cleansed, defiled and cleansed. He erected altars for idols. He built altars for the uh, idols of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He made his sons pass through the fire in the valley. So he's taking, he's following not his 
Father Hezekiah's footsteps, but he's following his grandfather's footsteps here. He made his sons pass through the fire in the valley of Ben Hinnom and practiced witchcraft, used divination, practiced sorcery, and dealt with mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. He also put the carved image of idols, which he had made in the house of God, where God said that he would put his name forever. So he's standing uh, against God, not hiding and sinning and defiling the temple. But after he was taken in captivity to Assyria and tortured with hooks bound in bronze chains, he entreated the Lord and humbled himself greatly. Would you, if you were God, would you forgive him? Uh, after all that he did at the face of God, in the temple of God, all the blasphemy, I would think that it would be difficult for him to be forgiven. But although he was extremely wicked, God was moved by his entreaty and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem. In this genealogy, this story shows us that you and I also have hope as long as we come back to God, no matter what kind of sins we might have committed before. God forgives us as long as we come back to Him. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. God's evaluation, He was extremely wicked, but He remembered His repentance at the end of his life. God remembered Manasseh's repentance. Next is Ammon. He followed his father's wicked ways and was killed by his own servants. Again, his, his evaluation, wicked. Josiah. He followed the way of David from young age. And he's another king that did the Reformation, right? Religious Reformation. He did not sway to the right or to the left. He was cleansing the temple and found the book of the law. And this is very important. Re uh, uh, finding, discovering the word of God in one's life. Not only in history like this, but in our life also. That begins the repentance, that begins the reformation. And not only does it affect that generation, but it will affect the following generations and that discovering, refinding the Word of God will save many souls and many lives. And so I sincerely pray that through these uh, proclaimed conferences that we may be able to find the Word of God again, discover the Word of God in our life. And in our congregation, may our congregation members also uh, receive and find the true Word of God in our churches and in their life. So as a result, he carried out a great reformation and, of course, God's evaluation, good. 17th and 18th King Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim, they were also uh, omitted from the genealogy of Jesus Christ. They were wicked kings. Jehoiachin or Jehoiakin, uh, he's, uh, he also followed the wicked ways of the kings before him and did evil in the sight of the Lord for the, uh, for the very short reign that he had, less than one year, and he's wicked. And then the last king, Zedekiah. Zedekiah, uh, during, his, during this time, uh, the temple was destroyed, and uh, the Babylonians completely destroyed Jerusalem. He was omitted from the genealogy of Jesus Christ also. 586 BC, it was during his reign, that Judah was taken into captivity and Babylon and the, uh, uh, by Babylon and the temple was destroyed. So the question that after we uh, quickly uh, went through the evaluation of the deeds of the kings in the southern kingdom of Judah, the question that we need to ask is this, why was the nation destroyed and taken into captivity? Why were they destroyed? First, they forsook and turned away from God. When, what caused them to turn away from God? The powers 
money, the women, idols, the pleasures, honor of this world, the glories of this world. Secondly, they neglected the commandments and the covenant of God. As kings in the kingdom of God, a kingdom that is established by God, as I mentioned in the introduction, what they were supposed to do is to enlarge the the borders of God's reign, bring the people into the nation under the, the umbrella of God's reign and His blessings and allow them to enjoy true peace and Sabbath. That was the role of the kings. And just like David did, seek for God's help. Seek for God, uh, His decision in every every uh, matter and every aspect of ruling over the kingdom. Because And they need to remember they are only kings that are ruling over God's kingdom. And therefore, they, they are managing. They're supposed to guard and keep, just like Adam was supposed to keep the garden. However, they neglected God's word, God's commandment, and His covenant, let alone passing down the, the covenant faith of God. Third, the upright faith of David had not been passed down to his successors. So we're in trouble. How did the lineage continue on to pass down the covenant? Because God's promise is to have the eternal king, the Messiah, come in the lineage, in the genealogy of Judah. But looking at all these kings, there are more wicked and extremely wicked kings than good kings. And it ended up towards the end with a series of evil kings and wicked kings. So how will Jesus come in this lineage? How, from what we look at, even this lineage, this genealogy, cannot but perish without the help of God. So let us now look at this chart, the evaluations of God. And so you can see here the names of the kings, good like David, okay, and good like the father. So there were only a few kings that received the evaluation. They were like David, right? And then they were just good. And then uh, some were wicked and some were extremely wicked. So let us chart it out. And this is what it looks like when you put dots uh, on, on the kings, under the king's names, according to their deeds. And let's draw some lines and look at this chart. What do we see? And, and we can see that the bottom line, the, the extremely wicked ones, they are influenced by the northern kingdom. Because Jehoshaphat got Jehoram married to Ahab's daughter, Athaliah. She brought in all the gods and the influences so Ahab, Jezebel, and Athaliah here brought in. And, and those who were related to them, this generation, this era, they were all either wicked or extremely wicked. So how, does, how is this kingdom, this, this uh, uh, lineage salvaged? See, this lineage... The, the covenant given, but given by God to this, this line of Judah, as we read in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16, is called the lamp of the covenant. God gave this lamp to David, and that lamp is the covenant, and eventually referring to the light that God will bring upon this nation and, and this people, and that is referring to Jesus Christ. It's, it's a covenant uh, of the light that is coming, and of the, the kingdom, the throne. God promised David that his son will be on the throne forever. However, his son Solomon was not on the throne forever. Rather, it was speaking spiritually and prophesying about Jesus, the eternal king, the eternal son. So let us look at the places and the times when 
the kings were wicked. The nation was perishing. What, what does God give them? Here, during the time of Rehoboam, God, gives, God mentions once again, reiterates and reminds them of the covenant of the lamp. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 36. It says, But to his son I will give one tribe, that my servant David may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen for myself to put my name. God reminds when, when we are at the bottom, we're down, when the kingdom is perishing spiritually, all surrounded by darkness, and even the king was influenced, God reminds them. It's like into the pitch darkness, God brings that lamp and rekindles that light of hope. And then another place is during the time of Abijah here. 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 4. But for David's sake, the Lord, his God, gave him a lamp in Jerusalem to raise up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. So again, God promises a lamp and reminds them and brings light upon darkness. And after that, see how this genealogy and the next king becomes good. It's not human effort. It's the grace of God that allowed them to be restored. The lamp of God. And then at, during this most wicked times, Second Chronicles 21, 17. Yet the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David because of the covenant which he had made with David. He remembers, God remembers the covenant, and he reminds his people. At the time of the, the, the darkest period, since he had promised to give a lamp to him, and his sons forever. And then, remember Ahaz? He's the one that uh, took away, destroyed the, the utensils of God's temple and established idols and shrines in the temple of God. During that time, God gives a special reminder and promise. And this is the promise of the Emmanuel. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and will, she will call his name Emmanuel. Amazing how God gives this most important and most precious covenant of Emmanuel during the darkest time, during the time of Ahaz. And so now as conclusion, we have to remember that we too are inheritors of the covenant. And what we need to do is to pass down that covenant to the next generation. The Bible continues to show us that unless this faith is passed down to the next generation, God's will is not fulfilled. And therefore, it is God himself who makes sure, just as we saw just now, makes sure that the covenant of God is continued on without being forgotten, without being uh, uh, wasted or, or, th or, or thrown away, destroyed by humans. And so by which deeds would you like to be evaluated by God? When if God, were st God was to evaluate me, what would I want him to see and remember? And as we lead our life of faith, let us remember that. And may we be able to pass down this covenant successfully. Because in Luke chapter 23, 27 through 28, it says, And following him was a large crowd of people when Jesus was carrying the cross, and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. It emphasizes the importance of passing down this word of God. It's not 
We can think about these uh, generations. Going back to this chart, looking at these generations. Even when Jehoshaphat was so good, Jehoram was evil. Even when Hezekiah was good, Manasseh was evil. Just because the father's generation was good doesn't mean the next generation will automatically be good. It shows us how difficult it is for us to pass down good faith to the next generation. Look, looking at uh, kings like Josiah, later prophets like Daniel, Prophet Daniel, he's the one that influences King Cyrus to understand the word of God and allow the Israelites to go back and return to Jerusalem. How did, where did Daniel find faith? It is because Josiah found the word and made the word be taught and read to the people. And if we calculate the years of the birth and the kings, Daniel's birth was around that time when Josiah was doing the Reformation and making the word of God being proclaimed. So this proclamation, proclaiming the word of God, is very important. Letting the word of God be heard by our families, our people, our nation, is a very, very important work. Let me read this passage. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you. He said it is a commandment, statutes, and judgments that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your sons and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes, his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. The words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit, down, sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And that is the command, the statute that God has given us. It's even judgment that God tells us that we should do. We should make it into our life so that our next generation, our children, can learn not by force, but by watching, but by example. Two more verses. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in a way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So if possible, we need to teach our children the Word of God from young age. 2 Timothy 3.15 And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. May this Word remain with us. We are learning about this, but Jesus has promised us that He will make us into royal priests. We are going, to, he's giving us the same task as the kings that we may bring God's reign upon this earth, that we may help to bring the, the kingdom of God upon our life and uh, our realm of this world. So, may our, the churches that are represented here, may all the pastors, all the leaders of the churches, may we be given that authority of the word not to abuse the power for ourselves, but may the word of God be passed down from us to next generation, be proclaimed from us to our generation and to different places, so that the reign of God, the kingdom of God may come upon us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this word. We thank you for teaching us through the kings, even the mistakes and the wickedness of the kings. And we find such wickedness even within ourselves. But Father, help us to return to you. Help us to humble ourselves and repent before you. And Father, please bless everyone here 
and bless every one of us that we may become your children that will pass down this covenant, eternal covenant of eternal life and eternal word to our next generation, that we may be able to proclaim this word to all the peoples, that you may become the eternal king for all nations. Thank you so much for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us give thanks to God.